Hey there, you're listening to Switch On, a podcast to shape the principles of modern leadership. I'm Helena Mach, and I'll be discussing real experience with successful leaders. Learn from them. How are they dealing with the challenges of today? And how are they building on their learnings for tomorrow's success? In this series, we will focus on leadership principles, where you can find yourself in a situation when you can bend the world to your will, yet you find yourself in a paradox. Welcome to this episode of Switch On. If enterprises are going to succeed in their digital transformations, they need to be able to shake up and challenge existing perceptions, mindsets within their organizations. In fact, not being able to challenge the status quo is one of the barriers to their success. Yet moving away from what we know and how it has always been done is a risky move. Not all transformations succeed. So I'm honored to be speaking about new opportunities linked to living transformations with Mario Andre Bruckner, digital and agile transformation expert, the founder of the Agilizer Network, New Work Solutions speaker and coach, and author of books, Remote the New Gold and the Digital Cookbook series with the next book, Agile Strategy and Transformation for the successful organization of tomorrow coming out soon. Welcome, Mario. Welcome. Thanks for having me here. Great to have you with us. Mario, you are a passionate advocate of a new generation agile leadership and a strong supporter of the fundamental transformation in organizations. But this is not where you started. Tell us more about your journey and the ambition that drives you. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, my journey was a classical one. I started very classical, so I studied economy. And also I am a reserve officer at the German army. And over years of, of uh, making progress in, in consulting and, and coaching in a classical way, uh, 2010, I got in contact with the first agile projects, or what they called at this time agile projects. And it was a new experience for me. And I was experiencing a new way of working, which is very flexible, very iterative. And this was the right work for the challenges what we did in this project. So there was innovative projects for a big automotive uh, company and also for pharmacy. And it was all about new environments, complex environments. And here we experienced the first um, touch points with Scrum, with Kanban, with frameworks, which at this time was new to me. And this um, makes me really a believer of those uh, frameworks of these methods for complex environments and complicated environments. And so this is why I put all my energy inside it to understand more, to travel around the world, to, to see other approaches, to, to see other uh, and exchange on different experiences in this environment. And now it's end up at, at this point that um, I'm now here and I, we we designing own approaches together with the network. And um, yeah, that's me. Wow, that's really a unique journey. And good to hear that you, you came across Agile already in 2010. As you mentioned, it's certainly one of the critical skills or competences, I could call it, for digital transformations as we live them today. Um, and we could, could actually say that digital transformation is the number one buzzword of the year. Um, There's so many misconceptions around it. And I was just reading one article um, uh, from Gartner and they estimate that 91% mm -hmm. of organizations are actually engaged in digital projects, trying to determine the right mix between digital optimization and transformation but many transformations unfortunately fail. The success rate is estimated only around 30%. We could actually call digital transformations a living organism. Mario, based on what you are experiencing with your business partners, where do you see the main reasons or challenges that limit the success of digital transformations? And actually we, we observed 
last five or ten years uh, different transformations and, and analyze why they fail and we came up with, with three points or three patterns which are very common and uh, first thing is if a, an organization start this journey to to change things to change their processes the organization um, they do it most of the time we call it as a hobby Mm -hmm. And what this means is um, they, they have their, their current job, so they have an operating system and they're delivering things and they are occupied 100% with their daily job already. And then add on, the company will change and transform and go on this journey of digital transformation. And it happens the same thing would happen with, with my hobby, for example. I have a hobby. Um, if you would see now my room here and there are two boxes, hyper boxes, and I listen to them sometimes if I have time. And this is my hobby, but I don't find time. So I do it just if I have a little bit time left, then I invest in this hobby. This is okay for a hobby, but if you do transformation work in this way, it will be never the focus. And you don't do it so seriously as you do your daily job. And this comes all back to this, how you approach the transformation. If you ask people who are motivated, do you want to join the transformation or do you want to improve things? What an engaged person will say. He say yes or she say yes. But the question is the wrong one. It's not about do you want, are you able to join? Because do you have capacity to invest in this area? This is a real question. And because the question is asked wrongly, everybody is more or less after the time disappointed because they have no capacity to invest in transformation, so they make no progress in it. So this is the first failure which we observe with, with digital transformations. The second thing is um, we see that companies, organizations um, building transformation teams. So specific teams who should drive the transformation. Most of the time with, with external experts, but also with internal. But the problem is this team should change an organization, but they cannot do it. The people themselves in the organization have to change. It's similar to if I go to, to a person and say, please change, uh, you need to change this. And, and the person, so I make him or her changing things. It's not working. You can change just yourself. And this is the reason why dedicated transformation teams uh, will, will not lead to success. You can have a team in addition, but, but it's not the main driver of a transformation. The main driver of a transformation is the organization, are the people themselves. They need to be the core of the transformation. So do not build an extra transformation or change team. Just make clear make a system design a system that your own people can change themselves and improve themselves and this leads me to the third failure or the third thing which we observed in the last years which leads to not successful digital transformations and this is priority or missing priority so if you start with a transformation it's like starting a journey and and then you you ask what we can improve or what we should improve and a lot of things comes into on the lists and, and come into discussions. It's a little bit like Christmas, yeah? It's, if I ask my children, what do you want? They have a big list of things. But as Santa Claus, uh, similar to this, they cannot deliver everything you need to focus. So I ask my children, please focus on, on specific things which are more important than others to you. And this is uh, why, why transformation fail also. They, they start with too many things in parallel. So you are, you are everywhere and nobody really focused. And this is the reason why you, you do a lot of things, but you do not see progress in, in, in these things. So it's about reducing the work in progress, reducing the RIP, setting clear priority based on the capacity you want to invest in the transformation. And this is very important, otherwise it fails. So it's three, three reasons. Transformation fail because it's transformation as a hobby. It's because they're building dedicated transformation teams to change others. And the third thing is they do everything at the same time without priority. Wow, that, that's really an interesting learning. So it's really not just about the intention, but also how serious you actually are about it and how able, how competent you are to be able to execute with success. Um, but I would assume that 
understanding the why is a must in every single scenario and understanding without overcomplicating. Clarity about benefits to the business and people's work is critical for their engagement, rollout and adoption. Communication about the purpose, acceptance of different perspectives and encouragement from the top is influencing actually the buy-in, minimizing distractions and resistance to change, to understand the returns. Behavioral change is another critical barrier to progress, I would say. What in your view is actually so different today that companies are realizing that they need to change? I think it's about the environment. Um, I think our environment um, changed really rapidly in the last years. Somebody called it a FUCA environment. Mm -hmm. I, I want to make it much more simple. Um, our environment, our competitors change very fast. And competitors of tomorrow are others than today. Mm -hmm. For example, I worked in the energy business and the energy business was really structured and very clear. The competitors was you can name it you can name it in, in one hand and this changed dramatically because new players literature players come into play this leads to a much more faster market cycles and in addition to this our customer or the potential customer behave and are different from 10 years ago 20 years ago to the today it's not anymore so easy to ask customer what do you want most of the time, you don't, they don't know what they want. And so we have to find new techniques to understand the customer, and also fast understand changes of the customer um, behavior. So it's not that you understood them one time and then you have it clear and you know it for the next three years. You need to find techniques and approaches how to do it on continuous basis to understand the customer. So it's about speed of the market to change competition get very high and very dense and very intense plus the customer is not so easy to read and this leads to to the situation that we have to rethink our business models and our capabilities every time and, and, and on continuous basis so it's not that you have one program or one project and then it's over. No, it's about a change. We need to change the system in a way that the system itself, system as an organization so itself is able to change actively on different or on, on changing of markets and customer behavior. So it's about the system change and not about a project or something like this. Yeah, you're so right. Everything is actually happening in parallel. And I also agree. Um, I often meet customers that are somehow struggling to gain the sufficient clarity or making the decision how to move forward or what is appropriate for them in terms of opportunities that they want to follow, where they have the biggest chances to succeed. And then looking for partners also on the next step when they need to, to define how to seize those opportunities in markets. But you are actually working with leaders um, that are dealing with the pain of failed transformation that had an intention that was maybe well designed but never saw the light of day in the reality and you're also working with those who want to go digital and don't know how to start what have you learned out of their stories and what would you recommend keeping high on our list in how we need to approach the change so that we are successful one thing you mentioned already, it should be very clear why we do these things. And um, I don't want to evaluate more on, on the why because you can read good books with it and sure. about it and they are right. But I would point out the urgency. So um, it's, it's a combination of understanding the why and the urgency why you change and, and why you do right now. Because if you say, okay, we need to do it someday, blah, 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 it will not create the momentum of change. And this is important and start with the leadership to, to point out where the urgency. There's a reason why we see companies and organizations which are completely or most, mostly agile um, and they're coming often from, from bad situation, from bankruptcy and so where the pain was very hard. 
And yeah. yes, the pain is a driver for, for a change, not a good one, and we want to avoid it. But you see that these companies who have no other chance um, to change become really good, agile uh, leaders. And, and they, they really embedded their, their agile ideas in the processes and in their organization. Um, so this the urgency should be really clear, communicated and understood. And it should be, if I would say it, people need to feel it. It's not about the brain thing, understanding it, they need to feel it. And is there no urgency? There's no reason to change. But if you feel the, understand the why and feel the urgency, it's important, and this is my, my, my takeaways from, from a lot of discussion of different um, people in different branches. So it's not concentrated on energy, automotive, or pharmacy. It's valid for all of them. It's important that you have a clear priority on things you change. So it's okay if you change or you plan to change things later in one or one and a half year, but it should be clear what you want to change now and what you change later, that people have a clear picture also where the priorities are. Second thing is, it, we really, I can really recommend to have absolute transparency on, on these transformations. Transparency means not good communication and big communication programs and, and concepts, no. Trans, trans, transparency is very easy. Trans, transparency means you show the people, everybody in the organization, how you work, that they understand how you work in this which way. And secondly, also you give them access to the results and the draft results also. I do have one, one uh, company, they, they use the living transformation approach to change their organizational structure. So something really important for, for a company organization. They, if you want to compare it, it's like a, an, an um, operation at, uh, at the heart. So they really change big things there decision rights, processes, organization, and they do the living transformation and they do it absolutely transparent. Yeah. Transparent. So people can see inside and in, in the results. And sometimes people fear, oh, we cannot show drafts or uh, whatever. They don't understand it. Come on. We are able to deliver babies. We are able to drive fast cars. We are adult enough why we should understand the organization changes and I also understand that these are drafts and we can contribute to it. It works. Just trust the people and trust their understanding of things. If you're absolutely transparent and you are authentic transparent, they, they, they do not fear things. They question things, yes, but this is how it went. Yeah? This is good that they question things because it becomes also new ideas, new view on things, but be transparent on your work. Second thing is commit allocate uh, capacity to, to the work. If they have capacity, your people, they, they will treat this work the same way they treat their usual work and they, they invest the time and you can expect also some delivery, but they need first to have the freedom to do things, to, to, um, to have time to also do a serious work with the transformation work. And the third thing is which we take away from, from all our discussions in, in different environments is we observe that in complex environments, we need to use agile frameworks. So it's not about that waterfall is, as, a, as a project method is the bad one or the V model, but it's just appropriate for comp uh, complicated environments. But in a complex environments, we learned that we need Agile methods, agile frameworks to scope this problem and to get good results. And now we, I step one step away and say, okay, what is more complex than digital transformation or transformation itself? It's the most complex topic which I could think of. So this is why we recommend to use agile methodology, agile frameworks, agile way of working in the transformation work. And this is not what we observe right now. In the moment, uh, if I see the plans of how they want to transform the company, it's completely waterfall. It's completely, as you can predict, in two years, this exactly will happen. That's the reason why I do this, this, and this, and this. How dare you? You cannot look so clear in the future. You don't know the results. So it's a complex environment, the transformation. And that's the reason we should use 
methods like or frameworks like like scrum working iterations um, we we should embed it feedback really early we should involve people in an efficient way but involve people because it's their change and this is what we embedded also in this living transformation approach we learn from agile way of working in different environments and embedded this one in a new way of doing transformation work in companies but sometimes it happens that leaders fail they don't things don't go as planned and we don't achieve the desired impact and then we start doubting ourselves. What should we do next? We start to self-reflect. What have we done wrong? How can we approach this differently? For me, actually, learning from failure is very important. We should embrace it and not be scared of it. Um, and I wanted to ask you, how do you manage to learn from the past, past mistakes? And what is your take on this approach? Um, first one, um, it's important to establish so-called points or reflection points that that uh, you do not do this kind of reflection after everything is over yeah? in old projects we, we did something like lessons learned at the end of the project you remember it so these lessons learned workshops it's okay yeah but it's like analyzing post-mortem everything is over and then you say oh next time what we could do better but next time there is no next time a project is a is a one-time thing which is over and then it starts something else in different configuration so a lessons learned should be or a learning point should be much more earlier that's the reason why in the agile way of working we establishes each iteration each sprint and to to reflect to observe things and then also to analyze why this happens um, I see often that these learning points are missing in, in uh, for example, transformations. And um, it's important to, to reserve time, to reserve also uh, and make it uh, really um, aware that this is important to contribute also, not only people who just work in transformation, it's also for stakeholders. And they, they can, they are uh, giving their feedback what can be improved in the, uh, in the living transformation, for example. We have every four weeks on team level, on transformation team level, so-called retro perspectives, where they analyze their work and on um, transformation program level every three months in uh, a learning point. And this is very important. Second thing is, if you do have a learning point, um, it's, it's important that you understand what happened to, by observing, not by interpreting. First, see, understand. And then it's important that, you, that we, we do not do too fast action. So we have to um, understand the root cause of it. And this is not a PhD work, a doctor or something like this. It's, it's about observing things and, and with a heterogeneous good analyzing what is the root cause. And this is not so simple often. Um, or in, in some environments, if it's on project level, for example, they, they try Scrum, uh, Scrum zombie kind of thing. And then after two, three months, they say, oh, it doesn't work at my environment. So we stop Scrum. And in and, and this case, we, we, if I uh, have the chance to observe what they really did, we find out it was not really Scrum. It was something in between. Yeah. So it's, it was like, like zombie Scrum and they <laughs> didn't try it seriously. Yeah. And so the root cause was not, or the reason for failing was not Scrum as a method, method was, uh, as a framework was wrong for it. It was, they just did master it. So they, they just, change it to their environment without mastering it first. So I, I love this uh, from lean perspective, this shuari that you say, okay, first I learn an approach, for example, the living transformation approach. I first learn the approach. It works in different environments very perfectly. So why it should work in, in my environment perfectly, let's learn it. Second thing is master it, become good with it. Uh, and this takes time. They are learning um, cycles. And then after this, you master something, shuari, and then you can adjust it if you want. But please don't adjust something where you have no idea of and you didn't test it seriously. And I think this is something, um, if it comes to learning culture, it's important first to have learning points where you reflect as a team, as but also with stakeholders. And second thing is to make a good analysis. What are the root causes behind an observation? And then also adjust things. And it's 
the adjustment needs to have um, an impact. And even if you're not right, if this adjustment is, is right, you can test it, it for the next iteration and then learn again. We, we, we don't have the, the silver bullet for everything, but we have a good approach to, to have a continuous learning set up in an organization. Right, so this continuous learning this way becomes a way of working, a way of understanding, but also a base for remaining flexible, being able to constantly adapt to the changing environment and changing situation that we are facing, right? Yeah. Um, you gave me a cue earlier uh, when you mentioned strategy. Um, actually, having the strategy is not enough someone needs to bring this vision to life as well. There needs to be a desire to change. And here, from my experience, middle management plays a very important role. They very much feel this pressure of changes and execution of digital transformation as they find themselves in one of the two situations. One, they're handed down only the vision outline, being asked to define ambition, design the strategy, mm -hmm. and key initiatives to achieve the goal. At the same time, not being really sure if they understood the guidance well enough. And two, the situation we often see is that middle management receives clear strategy guidance with clearly defined areas for transformation, and yet they feel powerless, being swamped with a limitless choice of information for technology selection, yet having no proper empowerment for their areas of responsibility. And there is this expectation to prove themselves again. So they often look for support. How can they make it a reality? Maria, with your hands-on approach, facilitating solutions, supporting the change to happen, closing the gap between what is believed that customers want and what they actually want, and incorporating this into product development, securing faster market entry, how do you experience this ambition and this struggle? How do you cooperate with middle management? First of all, I agree that middle management is a crucial role for this change. They can become a blocker, but they can be also become kerosene. Mm -hmm. So it's important um, that they are part of the change, that they are also the change. Um, I would answer on, on, on two dimensions. First thing is, I think it's important that the strategy work itself, it's not a closed job. I will evaluate on this a little bit deeper later. And second thing is, we need to support the management, the leadership, by transferring the strategy to the daily work. So to translate it into daily work that have a big impact. And for this, they need approaches, they need support by this task, because it's not a task which you, if you're born, you have it. And you have to learn it and you have to get experience with it. So these would be the, the two things. And um, I would go a little bit deeper. So let's start with the strategy. Sure. Strategy, as we know, it's, it's um, a board task. So it's a, the members of the board should decide on it. Decide on it. It means not that they should do everything. Um, and this, we have a really good uh, experience with, with an approach and we um, implemented this approach. It's called living strategy. And in the living strategy approach, we... Um, ask not some external companies to do our strategy as a company. No, we decided to use the source, the source of our own employees to contribute to a strategy work. Now you can think, oh, this is very inefficient. Everybody is uh, involved. It's like basic democracy or something like this. Everybody can talk, 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 and we come to, not to a result. But this is not the way if you have a wide and good structured, efficient approach. So what we do there is we, we ask people to contribute to strategy work and they have to apply with ideas and so on. So we'll, just to give you some numbers, we asked 3,000 people in a mid-organization, mid-size organization to contribute. We got 120 people um, to answering on it. And just 80 uh, make some explanations why they want to contribute. So we take this 80 and, and look for, um, for people in, in different subjects. So we build up a community of strategy experts. Um, but from their point of view, it's people who are at the front, who are really doing real job. 
and we found a way to translate this complex strategy language. So I'm teaching corporate strategy at the university, and I know that's complex. And for people who work in a different field, you have to translate something. So we translated it to something you can understand as, as a person who is good in, in something else and strategy work, but still can contribute. And we put it all together as a book and, and then let the manager read it. And they took this wisdom of the crowd into consideration for the final strategy. And they make this process very transparent. So it, strategy work was and is still the accountability of, of the leaders, of the top leaders of the CXO level. But the source, how they build the strategy, um, could be more than just external strategy experts. It could be much more. And on this way, you have benefits on both sides. The leaders, the top leaders, have much more information of, of people who really are good in their jobs and know the markets and know the changes, not on PowerPoints, on real changes and real uh, market demands. Plus, the people think it's their strategy and believe it's their strategy because it's decision, decided by the board members, but it's based on also input that they delivered and it was transparent. Yeah, bringing our own people ideas to life and building the strategy bottom up is much more powerful. This way people are more committed and determined to succeed when asked to realize it when they are involved early enough. And, and on this way, the strategy becomes not only a marketing instrument, which is on the web page, or it's, it's on the floor. If you're entering a building, you just imagine you're entering a big group and you have a nice entry with, with ladies and, and men sitting there and welcome you. And there's a strategy at the wall. But if you ask the people, they don't, uh, they don't know the strategy. So with a living, uh, living strategy approach, it's their strategy and it's, um, becomes also more understood. So it makes also easier later to translate the, uh, the strategy. This leads me to the second point, helps middle management or the leaders um, to, to uh, bridge the strategy to the daily work of the people. And here they, they need to, you, you can train them, you can coach them, by doing this job because this, this job is, is new for them. It's not that it's their daily business. How you can do it? First thing is we have to understand that the strategy should be connected to the daily work and the daily work are two things. First thing is delivering products, services, software, whatever. So delivering stuff which brings value to the customer and also daily work is transformation work to sharpen the access, to improve. And it's important that the strategy is reflected in both kinds of work, in the production of, of software and, and services and products, plus the transformation improvement works. And to bridge both things that are in line, you can use something like OKRs, objective and key results, that you, you can connect the strategy to the implementation and also to the living transformation. Um, fully agree with what you're saying. It's, it's really a complex process and you need to ensure both levels of implementation um, are aligned. But shaking up the status quo and mobilizing the organization for this kind of change inevitably means that leaders themselves need to be prepared to manage the company differently. Companies need to review whether they have all the necessary competencies and knowledge in-house or they still need to obtain those. Sometimes they need to assess how ready they are and how mature they are for this implementation of change. And during our last conversation, you have mentioned we need new ways of working. Collaboration, agility have new and different meaning today than before. And earlier we touched how important it is to embed this continuous learning in our day-to-day -day processes. But how would you say those processes become an integral part of how we operate, how to actually keep this momentum of this ongoing development. Um, how to keep this momentum? I think this company or this organization needs a change and that leaders are ready to make the change happen. This means that they are 
not in the way of a transformation, that they're part of a transformation, and that they are bold enough to change things. And it's important that leaders do not fear this change of process organization and that they support this. If people understand and see both understanding and seeing later that people, uh, leaders behave different, are open to changes, also to changes which have impact on their job, on their role, on their environment. If they see this, then they, they will trust and you get them on board and they will go to all changes uh, which need to be happen based on the market changes there with you. And you, you said before, um, that, that uh, companies have to check if they have capabilities or if they have to go to, to other markets or if they need to hire new people. My strong belief is that the most organization has the right people already on board. So it's not about that you need to have a, need to hire agile people who think agile, have an agile mindset. This is bullshit. I think that you as a system shaper, shaper, as a leadership who change an organization in a way that it have impact on the behavior of, of your employees, that these employees will develop, will change themselves in a way to, to these uh, resources and, and people you need to, for the future. So you have already the right people on board. It's just about you to change the system, to change processes, to enable them and, and give them chances. For example, we offer learning journeys, a world specific that the people can not take a training out of a catalog. This is old school 20 years ago, and this doesn't work. It's not motivating. It's, it's about giving employees the chance to develop themselves in their own pace and find a system where they're intrinsically motivated to, to be part of the change to, to be your, your future of the organization. But you don't have to hire brilliant guy, guys outside. It's just about you as a leader to change the environment in a way that the people can develop themselves, that it's for your future and for your future existence also. So the responsibility and the accountability of, of these system changes is in the hand of the decision makers, of the leaders the impact of agility um, in, into how we develop people, how we lead people, how we want to um, grow people. And this leads then indirectly to, to the company culture. And this is also important to take into consideration. Listening to what you're saying, much has changed, right, from where we started and where, where we are today, because change is really becoming central to every interaction, forcing both organizations and individuals to adapt, learn, and progress more quickly than ever before. And everybody needs to become more flexible, open to change, start thinking ahead. And I'm thinking about the need for the culture that you, you have just mentioned um, in terms of the constant learning. But it, this doesn't happen overnight. Actually, culture is developing and shaping together with the digital transformation. I remember you saying earlier how important it is to involve our own teams, our own people from strategy design to implementation. But nevertheless, to speed up the change, large organizations often outsource innovation projects or um, uh, contact smaller companies, or on the other hand, empower smaller in-house subdivisions to develop new digital solutions. This way they become quicker, finding solutions that are simpler and highly effective that open up new opportunities. How do you see this parallel approach working in practice? How successful do you think large enterprises are in scaling this approach across the organization? I think it's difficult to answer in general. Um, you have to take a look on specific uh, examples here because we observe um, companies who are successful with this approach to, to I would say, outsource innovation. And uh, we see also companies who were just at the beginning successful and then have really dysfunctions later. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, the answer would be specific on, on a company, but in general, uh, it is a sweet poison to, to think about to outsource innovation. I will explain. It's sweet because if you hire an agency or an, a specific company, they will have fast successes, much faster successes than you could have in your Google because on your processes, on your time of, of what you are, all have to take into consideration. So there will be successes. The problem is two things. First thing is to integrate these nice ideas back in your ecosystem, which exists. And the second thing is that on this way, you do not foster innovation in your main company where you have these issues where you have these challenges. So, and, and both things are, are not good because um, if you develop a product somehow, somewhere and, and, you, and it's on the market, it should be, or it will be somewhere is the need to connect, to reconnect it to your existing environment. For example, to your master data that you're just talking about one, comp uh, one customer. Yeah? And here complexity comes into play. In, in groups, you have complex systems, IT systems, which are not so easy to change and you cannot um, put a button on and then it's everything efficient. So um, if you develop and have innovations, you should think also about operation later, that it's um, fitting to your ecosystem of the overall group. That's the one thing. So typical example is um, at the hackathon. Yeah, if you make a hackathon, it's two days and, and people designing nice apps. And I was part of a ju jury at the hackathon. And uh, close to me was another jury member. He was a CXO of a mid-sized company. And after one or two days, he said, Mario, why the guys are so fast and we are so slow. It takes four or five months until we do this, what they do in one day. But this was just the surface. So they make a nice app, yes, and it works. But if this challenge would be to use in this app existing data, existing master data, ex existing uh, compliance and data privacy rules of the group, it should take also four or five months. You be, have to be honest what you compare. And easy successes with the UX, with the user interface, and what you see as a prototype, as a mock-up, as we call it in the digital world, um, it's so hard to integrate in an ecosystem which is existing that's the first thing and second thing is what i mentioned was innovation to do it externally or as a new company it, it foster the way the new way of working in this environment but no impact on the mothership i would say on the organization of the old organization so what this means think about it in a strategic way do you want that this new Thing what you founded there and which is growing and a new way of working. Is this, is this your future? And in direct logic would be the old mothership, old, and you, you just think about when you need to retire it. So you just plan about the insolvency right now because you know that everything goes there. I don't think so. Integrating innovation into an existing organization, it's much more challenging than having some external small companies doing it i know but the life is not easy and and this is worth doing it to integrate innovation that every everybody can profit from it yeah. last perspective from it is, is an uh, employee perspective how do you would how would you feel if you observe that all the crazy sexy stuff is done in another company mm. So this would, would lead to a demotivation and also it leads to an observe it that then the talent of the old company disappear. They go to the new one or to somewhere else. Mm. So this is sweet poison and um, I wouldn't take the sweet poison and I would go for the challenge to integrate innovation in my daily processes in my company to think and use uh, to, to think about optimization, optimization, to use digitalization to, to fasten my processes, to fasten the time to market, 
to set up a system, an incentive system, and an, an reporting and behavior uh, environment where, where it's good to deliver fast, to get rid, for example, of unnecessary gate processes where they are not needed. Mm. Yeah. All, and, and I think I would go this way, yeah. All very relevant challenges that you're raising. Um, I've been working with some very big enterprise companies and um, I fully agree you need to find the right balance and the right approach for this unique environment and it should be tailor-made for that specific environment. On the other hand, in, in certain companies, we see, let's say, traditional blockers who don't believe that the change is possible and they're actually limiting um, application of change. And this way, companies are trying to show other examples that it's actually not impossible. On the other hand, um, this is also a way to, to move away from tried approach uh, because simply the, the resistance to change is so high um, that without it, you, you cannot even open up to new opportunities to look outside of the box. But I fully agree with what you're saying. You need to be cautious and you need to find the right balance for the environment where you're working in. The resistance of change is high and, and it becomes high or get bigger to it. But here we can take a look on the nature of the resistance and in which areas people feel threatened, in which, in which situation they feel um, that they are not comfortable. It's all the same. It's if something changed and I don't understand it. So that's the reason why in, in living transformation approaches, it's so important to have this transparency. Second thing is you, you feel resist or you, you, um, you get more resistant if I'm not part of the change. That's the reason why I should be a contributor to this change and work on daily basis in this transformation work. Because then it's not that somebody informed me about changes after a half year in a big company uh, meeting and he, these are the changes. No, I change them with them. So this is, um, I think, a very good, good thing to reduce resistance, absolute transparency and making them part of the change and honestly making the part of the change, not that they we decide something and then we make them think that there was their decision. No, really contributing to the transformation work. And even then in this situation, we don't make it, we need to make it even um, diamond and everything is nice and shiny. There are still always people who are against something. Yeah. But you can reduce this to 10 to 15 percent. And I, I make my life easy here. Yeah. I start with the guys who want to change and want to contribute. The living transformation is an approach where you assign capacity to organizational units and you give prioritization to this um, to, to, to the next transformation increment of three months. But people decide themselves if they want to contribute. Mm -hmm. So the, the organization units like in a big team, uh, get a percentage of capacity and, and people decide themselves how they can use it and do I want to be part of it. So work with the people who want to be part of it and the other will follow if you have success. Yeah, I agree. This was my learning as well. Making people an integral part of that change is a critical component um, yeah. because they, they actually need to understand the benefits for themselves, their role in, in terms of contribution to the change and how they're actually making through their effort, the organization better uh, for their environment where they are working at and for their customers. But this is again linking us to the culture. The culture is actually developing through the, the process itself. And it's actually one of the vehicles to challenge the status quo. Uh, the one that embraces technology, the one that encourages taking calculated risks, thinking out of the box, the one that is actually rejecting complacency, empowering employees that we have mentioned to lead and overcome these challenges. Um, tell me more about the progress you are seeing that encourages this fresh thinking and intellectual risk taking for your experience what is the most uh, let's say most common reason that tips the scale in people's minds that are becoming more engaged in driving the change it's, it's experience there's nothing which you can do over uh, argumentation 
um, you can start by argumenting and convincing people to test things, to try small things. But ex experience is the kicker. It's a scaler. You scale it up. And, and if they have small experience, if they are able to make a small experience of how they can contribute, how their voice is, is, is uh, take, taken into consideration, for example, in the living strategy approach, how their voice is, is in, in, uh, taken into consideration in the strategy developing and their experiences, then it will grow. It's just experience. Start with something small and, and you will have the most impact of people who they realize and, and that they see and observe and also see the impact on system changes in their daily life. If, if they experience this, it will grow and it will scale. Doing business as usual is a thing of the past. Of course, today is important because it generates our current value. But if the day after tomorrow doesn't become part of our organization, we won't make it there. It's that simple. The good news is that we are not alone and that there are ways to prepare us for that, experiences and practices that work. So for the conclusion, what would you recommend to our listeners to keep high on their list, to empower them to move forward and to help them ensure they get there? Um. Change your system. Interpret your leadership role um, as a system changer. The people are good. They will adapt to systems. They will adapt to the future. It's about you that you give them a clear direction and design a system that you have an organization which are future-proof and flexible and open for, for customer changes. And the approach of, for example, the living strategy gives you a chance to do this on a continuous basis and also implement it over the living transformation into your organization, not one time on a continuous basis, but still efficient. An important message. The role of a leader is to create an environment where everybody can collaborate and remove the barriers that limit the ongoing development. It was a real pleasure to speak with you, Mario. I have learned so much and gathered so many applicable ideas for business immunity and endurance. Thank you for the inspiration and reminding us of the importance of engaged teams, the role that people play in progress when bringing organizations forward. Thank you to having me and it uh, was a very fruitful uh, discussion and uh, interview and thank you so much for it. Thanks. Great to have you with us and thank you for sharing your experience. You're welcome. The conversation with Mario has again confirmed that transformations are more about the people than they are about the technology. When bringing a vision to life, there are so many critical moments when we can miss and thus fail. People engagement, their trust, their commitment for the change to happen make all the difference and are critical for success, even more so when the change comes from within. This podcast is brought to you by Drop of Milk, an impact-driven business consultancy and expert on customer-focused digital transformation. You can learn more at dropofmilk.com.